is radial axle or dual view ICP, which do you choose? And Ma Manny Alameda will be presenting. We will be addressing questions at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to submit the questions throughout the presentation using the question function. Manny, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Shelley. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, welcome uh, to the today's webinar. Um, we're going to take a look at choosing between axial, radial, and dual view ICP. Uh, in this webinar um, sort of came out of conversations I've had with uh, salespeople and users um, over time, um, particularly when somebody's trying to decide what the best view for their particular application is. And there are you know, some basic questions you need to, to ask yourself to determine which is the, which is the best view. And it, this will be pretty high level discussion, so we're just we're not going to look at you know, any scientific criteria. These are just going to be some basic questions, um, some comparison between the relative strengths and weaknesses or disadvantages and advantages of the various views um, that are available for ICP or the way to configure, to configure the system that you want. Okay, just um, a little bit about Teledyne Lehman Labs. Um, we're a U.S.-based manufacturer of developmental analysis equipment uh, located in Hudson, New Hampshire. We've been manufacturing ICPs for over 30 years. Um, we also manufacture uh, mercury analysis systems, um, the Hydra and the Quick Trace series of mercury analyzers, and those cover atomic, uh, coal vapor atomic absorption and fluorescence and solid mercury analyzers. We also manufacture DCR, which is for elemental analysis of solid materials, nitrides, carbides, high purity copper, things like that, and the Prodigy 7 and Prodigy series of ITP OES systems for analysis, elemental analysis of liquid systems. Um, here's the sort of view of the particular equipment that we manufacture. Um, the information that will be presented in the webinar today will be um, featuring things. Uh, configurations um, from the Prodigy 7 ICP. And we'll just move on. Um, just basically, um, if you're not familiar with ICP, it's a multi-element technique that uses a plasma to excite atoms, so emit wavelength-specific photons of light, characters of each element. The number of photons is directly related to the sample concentration, so you generate a calibration curve um, to determine element so concentrations in samples. It's a comparative technique based on um, standard calibration curves and such. And just briefly, ICPs consist of optical system, power supply, and sample introduction. Um, today we're going to focus on the configuration of the system, uh, of the sample introduction, whether it's axial, radial, or dual view. Okay. So plasma views. So currently, modern ICPs are available with three different viewing configurations, radial, axial, and, and the dual view. And each view has its own advantages and disadvantages. Um, what we found over time is that no, no one view fits everybody, all the applications that people need to be able to do when they want to run samples by ICP. Um, some views have a particular advantage or a disadvantage in different types of matrices, different samples, constant elemental concentrations, um, or aqueous, organic, and high level of dissolved solids. They all, all of these things come into play when you're trying to determine what the best view for a particular application is. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first view, we'll talk about radial ICP. This is the original ICP view. For, from the time ICP was introduced until about the very early 1990s, all ICPs were radial view. Typically, in the beginning, people when ICPs first started being used, manufacturers had made systems like Spark and Arc systems and basically just removed the Spark stand and put on an ICP, which was in, which was in a radial view. Um, and as time went on, people introduced sequential instruments um, to get better flexibility. But the original view was, for, was, was radial. Sometimes these are called vertical or side-on plasmas, depending on on the particular manufacturers. 
one of the advantages of the radio ICP is it pretty much accommodates all all matrices that you can do by ICP, whether it's aqueous, organic, say wear metals and oil, things in kerosene, xylene, toluene, solvents like that, high levels of dissolved solids, um, brines, you can analyze up to 30% brine in a with a radial ITP with appropriate nebulizers and spray chambers. Okay. Detection limits are very similar to what you would see in Flame AA. Um, there's a bit of overlap. I have a, a slide later, a little bit later in the presentation that compares that. Um, some elements by radial ITP are much better than you would get in Flame AA, particularly for the refractory elements, things like t silicon, titanium, boron, elements like that. If you ever tried analyzing boron or tungsten on a flame AA using a nitrous oxide acetylene flame, you know it's a, it's a bit of a challenge. You've got to get everything just right, get the right view in the flame. Where on an ITP, there's really no difference in running boron or tungsten as there is in running um, copper or, or manganese. The, the instrument can handle that and give you very good results very, very easily. Right? One other addition to the ICP is it can analyze sulfur and phosphorus. Um, AA can analyze phosphorus, but the detection limits are, are generally far too poor for, for most normal use. And with some special optical um, configuration, uh, the ICP can also analyze halogens, so you can analyze copper, um, chlorine and bromine in samples in addition to the traditional elements. Right? So radial ICP is a, or vertical, so we, we view the plasma from the side. Um, you see here is a view of a radial plasma with um, some about a thousand ppm yttrium being analyzed in it, and depending on where you are in the plasma, um, we have different species emit down low on the plasma. We, we see atoms in the middle. We see ions, and traditionally, this is where the measurements are going to be made. The instrument will focus the light from this region of the plasma and get that into the into the spectrometer to make measurements, and then the top. Where we see where it's, we see that red bit of flame, of the red tail flame, uh, we see molecules. We keep this, um, present this as we go to the axial. So you see some things that happen in a radial plasma. There are certain types of interferences that occur very high in the plasma up here in the what we call the tail flame, where the molecules are, and way down in the bottom of the plasma, also where we can see some types of interferences, which we don't see very much in the radio because we're looking here in the middle in this blue region where the ions are. So it's relatively interference free. When we go to axial dual view, we then now have to worry about some interferences and we'll, we'll take a look at that um, in a bit. Characteristics of radial viewing, um, very wide dynamic range. So you can analyze relatively low to relatively high concentration. So you can have things that are in, you know, in PPV level or high PPV level up to percent level of 1,000 ppm or more depending on, on the type sample. Um, you can use a, a one advantage of ICP. There's lots of different wavelengths you can use. So you can find wavelengths to look at low, low concentration elements and you can find insensitive wavelengths to, to measure very high concentrations of elements. So in, as a result, you'll wind up doing fewer dilutions than you would do, um, especially when you compare it to to atomic absorption. It has excellent tolerance to high dissolved solids in it. Right? So for example, we have many users who will analyze 33% sodium chloride straight uh, without any dilution. Um, the level of dissolved solids depends on the particular solid. Some um, may only be able to go up to 20% or 10%, uh, depends on the solid. But you can actually do very good analysis with a minimum dilution to try and maintain um, the, a good detection limit uh, capability. Radial torches um, last a long time. Most of the, the virtually all of the plasma is outside the torch. Um, this is not the case for some of the other views. So you get very good um, torch lifetimes. De again, it depends on the type samples that you're running. If you use samples that require um, fusions like sodium borohydride or lithium metaborate, um, I'm sorry, sodium borohydride, uh, lithium metaborate um, or sodium carbonate fusions. Um, they can be really rough on the torches, but um, most applications give you very good lifetime on the torches. 
has negligible, easily ionized element effects. Um, and this is a case where you can have the high concentration of one element, say sodium or potassium, affect the, con the, viewed, the determined concentration of an element like sodium. Um, by you picking the correct viewing position in the radial plasma, you can minimize these or, or in most cases, in a, lot, in a lot of cases, virtually eliminate it so it's not as big an issue as it, on the radial as it can be on some of the other views. And characters that you get radial detection limits, so you're looking at um, single single digit PPB levels for for many elements, many common elements that people want to do. The next view is the axial view, right? sometimes called the horizontal plasma. So when people were beginning to do a lot of analysis in the sort of the 1980s, um, there were a lot, there was a program called CLP and we would analyze 27, 20 or 30 elements by ICP. Um, typically it was done by simultaneous ICP, so the analysis was really quick. You could get all those elements done in just you know, a minute or two, uh, tops with you know, sample uptake and rinse, maybe 10 second integrations and get all the data. There was a few elements that you could not do by radial ICP or could not meet the, requir the contract required detection limits and these were elements like arsenic, selenium, lead and thallium and these would be done by graphite furnace and you could run through many many samples on the simultaneous ICP and the bottleneck was trying to get those four elements to get through the graphite furnace um, quality control protocol. So an attempt was made to be able to do those, analyze those elements on the ICP and one, one, the approach that was tried was to actually go to what was called an axial plasma which basically rotates the torch 90 degrees and now rather than look across the torch you now look down through, through the middle of it. Right? And what that allowed people to do was to increase or to improve the detection limits of those elements where the axial plasma was now able to meet those contract required detection limits. But there, then there were a number of other applications that people wanted to use ICP but needed to get better detection limits. So the axial ICP was, was, was born. It wasn't new. People knew about axial ICPs in the past, um, well before they came out, but there was really no need to go to, to better detection limits. And then once when the market decided that it needed to go to better detection limits, the axial ICP was, was born and became a, a very, very popular um, addition to the capability of ICP. So you can get useful analysis in a lot of different sample matrices. Um, not everything. There are some matrices that are far more problematic to run in an axial ICP than on, than on a radial ICP. The big advantage of the axial ICP is our detection limits. You can get your detection limits improve anywhere, depending on the element, anywhere from a factor of five to a factor of 20, um, depending, again, depending on, on the particular element that you have. But it does have some limitations. Can't, you can't run anything. Um, it, it's a bit more sensitive to matrix interference. So when you run things on an axial plasma, you've got to be more careful with, your, with matrix matching. Um, people tend to use internal standards far more frequently on an axial plasma than they do they do on a radial plasma. So it's a little bit more tricky. Um, sodium and potassium can have issues. You are now you're not looking through the region in the plasma where the ions are present. You are now looking through the entire plasma. You can get some interferences on that top part of the the. Of, top part of the plasma that we saw in that previous slide in that red area um, by nature of the design axial plasmas get rid of that what, what's called the recombination zone um, where you would get some interferences but you can also get interferences in the bottom of the plasma for of the alkali elements um, which you have to deal with um, by either change uh, adding some ionization suppressants or ionization buffers to the sample so you may add a thousand ppm cesium to everything sample standards everything um, to try and overcome the what are called the interalkali effects or the easily ionized element effect 
So it complicates sample preparation a bit. You know, you've got to add a relatively expensive reagent because of purity. The axial plasma has much better detection limit. So the purity of the material has to be more. And you're not, <clears throat> excuse me, you're now adding about 1,000 ppm of dissolved solids to every sample. So if you take a look at the axial ICP, you rot it's rotated 90 degrees. You are now looking at it from left to right. And you're now looking over this much longer path length. And that's one of the reasons you get the better sensitivity, as opposed to looking across like you do in the, in the radial. So why, why the axial ICP works is the well, signal is proportional to the path length. So when we view axially, the, the spectrometer is set up so that it really only looks at the central channel of the plasma where the analyte signal is and blocks out the area where the, of the plasma on the outside where the background is high. So we've increased the, the amount of signal that we're getting and we've also reduced the background because now we're looking at the cooler central channel. So we get a, an improvement in signal to background and that translates into, into better detection limits. And generally it's about five to 20 times. So on average people would say by rule of thumb, you get about a 10 times increase in detection limits overall. Again, depending on the element, um, you get very, very good improvement in detection limits for sodium and potassium. Unfortunately, they suffer from some of the interalkali effects, so it can complicate um, those analyses quite a bit. Okay. So dedicated axial viewing, so roughly 10 times better detection limits than you get on a radial system. Now the dynamic range shifts to lower, so you look at a dynamic range on the ICP, radial ICP is, when people say it's around you know, uh, six orders of magnitude, um, you still, with an axial, you'll still get those six orders, but they're going to start one order of magnitude lower. So you don't increase the dynamic range, you just shift it lower by roughly one, one order of magnitude. Right? Less tolerant to dissolve solids than the radial is, um, again, because of the need to have better matrix matching um, than you do on the radial. Um, and also, related to the dissolved solids, is torch lifetimes are going to be shorter than what you would see on a radial. Um, and pop, that's partially because the plasma is largely contained inside the torch, as opposed to the radial, where the plasma is, is most of the plasma is outside the torch. So you have a, a plasma which is inside the torch, and you have a small amount of, of coolant gas that's isolating the plasma from the, from the, from the quartz. Um, depending on the matrix that you're running, it can be very, very rough on the, on the torch. Um, if you do fusions, high levels of dissolved solids, brines, um, anything, you know, anything that has alkali metals in it seems to cause problems with torch lifetimes in active view. And it's a pretty common complaint um, from users um, about torch lifetimes in, with axially viewed systems. Okay. And you also have the potential for the easily ionized element effect which you have to deal with by adding um, ionization suppressants, um, where on the radial you can simply change, uh, optimize the view to try and minimize that effect. With the axial ICP, you can't because you are still you are looking through the the entire plasma. The combination zones is removed by the whatever mechanism could be a shear gas or cool cone or um, ICP MS type cone. Um, to get rid of that, but you still have to look through the bottom of the plasma, and those are interferences that you can't deal with in any optical fashion. So, to get around the problem, I mean, the axial had had great applications for people, much lower detection limits than they could get with the traditional radial. Um, so, one way to approach the problem to address the limitations of the axial plasma. Manufacturers came out with what were called the what, what, were, what were called dual view ICP, and essentially that combines both radial and axial views in one system. Right? Basically, still an axial configuration where the torch is rotated 90 degrees, but we now add the ability to also look at the plasma in the in the radial view. So it gives you the the sensitivity of the axial. You still have that, the better detection limits that you get. 
But now you add the, the sort of the sample versatility of the radial ICP. We can now analyze samples that are have much higher concentrations than we could get in the axial, where we would be bumping up against the dynamic range limitation of the axial plasma by giving the potential to view the plasma in also in the radial view, we can get that that back and also add the relative freedom from matrix effects. So by going from the axial plasma to a dual view plasma, we can get around the problems that you would see with the alkali metals and even the alkaline earth metals that can cause problems on each other. Um, we could sort of elim mostly eliminate those issues uh, by using the radial view on the on an axial pl plasma and provides a great comfort factor. Now with a with the dual view system, you can probably handle most of the type samples that you might want to, um, that you might need to analyze. You, if you have a single view, either an axial view or a radial view, you know, there's a there's a, pro a potential where you can't get some samples analyzed. Um, but by switching to a dual view, that makes people a little bit more confident and winds up being able to handle uh, determine most elements that they need or run most of the sample types that they need. So you basically will have the right view pretty much for any sample. But again, we'll see in a little bit, um, we'll look at some things where, you, where dual view probably isn't the right answer. Right. So sort of a close up here. So what you can see is so looking down the middle here, we're focused on the axial plasma. So the injector right here where the mouse um, pointer is, is the injector. So we look at sample, we focus down for the axial. We then have a, a dual view mirror here, which is off to the side. And we can switch something internally, which we'll see in a, in a second, to be able to pick up that radial view. Now, one thing you should notice also, this is the, the dual view set up on the Prodigy 7. Um, on this instrument, when we developed it, we took a look at one of the concerns was is always torch lifetime, particularly on axial and on dual view systems, and especially dual view systems. Um, to be able to get that radial view, you either have to put slots in the torch, or you can put a small hole there where the actual where the radial view will be picked up. The slots can be um, can be attacked again by aggressive samples. You know, um, lithium metaborate fusions, brines again can attack that. So we wondered what would happen if we, rather than use the extended length torch that we've been using for years for the axial and radial view, if we just used a, a traditional radial length torch, and that's what you see in there. So we've gone, we've sort of abandoned on the Prodigy 7 using full the typical dual view and axial torches. We now use the exact same torch um, for dual view and axial view. Um, that we use for the radial system to try and increase the lifetime of the torch, um, and that that seems to be working pretty well. Um, we had done for years. We had always done um, the traditional axial and dual view torches, and we did a little bit of a lot of investigation before we we came out with this to find that actually, if uh, we really didn't need to extend the length of the torch, so we try to address the, the common complaint that people have with dual view torches and axial torches having um, abbreviated lifetimes compared to radial torches. Now, to get the, to switch between the axial and radial view, um, it's typically done with movement of one optical component. Um, for us, we, we move a mirror. We use, um, on all our systems, we have a, what we call a source mirror that focuses the light from the plasma onto the entrance slit of the instrument. Uh, we also use that mirror to optimize the particular view so if you're in radial view, you can optimize the view by using an element like manganese, and the system will go and sweep left and right and vertically into the, pla in the on the plasma itself and to determine what the best view is. We can also use that mirror to switch between axial and radial views. So here is the setup when the instrument is in the axial mode. After all, and after all the samples are run in axial mode, the mirror will switch very slightly change position is really because of the length, the distances involved, the, the position of the mirrors actually moves a very small amount and now allows us to pick up the, the radial view. This is, sort of, this is a, just a basic schematic. Here is the actual, um, in the Prodigy 7, how we switch between axial and radial view. So basically you're looking 
from the top of the instrument down, all the covers are off, and you can see here the, the torch. And then these two green cones are the acceptance cones for the axial and radial view. So if we start to run a sample, the instrument will be in the radial axial view. We'll be looking at the torch in, in, that, in that fashion. We then take this mirror and we'll, and I, this is not a lot, this one doesn't actually move, this is sort of a screen capture from a CAD, CAD drawing. Um, we will move this mirror very slightly and then pick up the, the radial view which would have, which would be picked up from the mirror that's here, which I took out um, to have a little bit more clarity. So we can switch back and forth between each view. So with one sample analysis, you get all the axial elements and you get all the radial elements by running each sample one time. And also notice that it's a radial length torch that's used in the in the system to try and increase the lifetime of the system, oh, lifetime of the torches. Okay. So characteristics of the radial view, again, you because it's, a, it's basically an axial system, you're going to get the improvement in detection limits, roughly a factor of 10. Okay. You now get very wide dynam dynamic range. You're going to get the original dynamic range of the plas of the radial plasma, along with the order of magnitude or so lower le lower dynamic range um, or to lower concentrations on the axial view. So you have a system that can go from very low to very high concentrations. Right? The dynamic range shifts lower with the axial view. <clears throat> Tolerance to dissolve solids is pretty much the same as the dedicated axial system. It's fundamentally an axial um, system with um, a mirror to pick up the radial view. So you still have the same limitations for dissolved solids that you would on the axial view. Lifetimes are still a bit shorter. Um, again, it's, it, it is an axial view. Um, we try to address that by having the system use just a, a radial torch, but overall um, dual view systems you still notice the, the lifetime of the torch is, is a little bit is a bit shorter, right? Okay. And again, for the dual view torches, they're longer than gen, typically longer than the radial design. They are in our older systems, and you use a slot or a hole to get the radial view. Um, and the slots can be attacked by element, um, especially alkali elements that happen to be in the sample, especially if they're high concentrations, like you would have in in different types of fusions. Right? The easily ionized element effect <clears throat> can be largely eliminated by using the radial view of the dual view option. So if you want to measure sodium and potassium or some of other alkali elements, <clears throat> rather than have to be able to add ionization buffers um, to all the samples and standards, you put sodium and potassium into the radial view and they can be analyzed just as you were running on a standard um, true radial system with the vertical plasma. You can also put really high concentration elements on the radial view. It, you don't use the radial view just to do sodium and potassium. You can do elements that are really high concentration. So for example, if someone is trying to analyze um, additive elements in, in engine oils, you, you can go with the dual view type system. You can look at very low concentration for some elements, but then the additive elements like um, phosphorus, zinc, magnesium, calcium can be present at hundreds of thousands of ppm. You, that would be an, I, an ideal situation where you put that those elements on the radial view and look at the lower concentration elements um, on the axial view. And also with the dual view, you can analyze your samples one time. And the instrument will do everything in the radial or axial mode. The mirror will switch and do everything in the axial mode with one, one sample, um, one analysis per sample. And that cuts down on the amount of waste, cuts down on the amount of gas that you're consuming. So it keeps the cost of analysis down. Okay. And just a sort of a general comparison between the different views, um, configurations uh, with dynamic range and detection limit. Um, and we just have um, graphite furnace and flame A, a there just, just, as, um, just for comparison purposes. So you can see the um, dynamic range of the axial and radial systems and you combine it. You get really good dynamic range on the with, with a dual view system combining both. Um, detection limit wise, you can see 
the radio compares very well with uh, flame AA type detection limits, so it's a little bit lower for some of the more refractory elements. Detection limits for ICP, for axial ICP, are pretty much the same as dual view, but then you get the, the overall really low concentrations up to the really high concentration. So, the com so by combining the views in a dual view system, you sort of get the a lot of the 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 benefit of the performance of both of the of the standalone systems. And it's one reason they uh, dual view systems have become um, have become pretty popular. Um, you do get quite a bit of range in capability. Um, you can analyze elements that you just sample you you can't really get to with with a traditional radial system, particularly for the elements for the um, optic selenium, lead, and thallium elements like that, the axial plasma or dual view plasma gives you much better detection limit capability. Okay, so that sort of covers what the basic advantages and disadvantages of the two systems, or the three different configurations. Um, so what's the best way, what's the way to approach if you are looking at getting an ICP and you, and you have the decision to make, well, wh what would be the best configuration for you to get? So you need to consider a few questions, right? <clears throat> So before you commit to decide, before you commit to getting one of these different ones, you need to ask yourself a few questions. And we we've, we've tried to limit this or whittle this down so we can ask sort of the minimum number of questions to be able to get to to what the end you know what the end game should be. What what would be the best view? Now these are not these are sort of general, and there are other considerations that may come up during the, you know, during the process where you're looking to, to acquire an ICP, but this is really just to get the conversation going and get it going in the right direction. Right. So first, we need to know what, are your sam what, what sample types are you going to analyze? What are the concentration ranges in those samples? And are you going to determine any of the alkali metals? And that can also be some of the alkaline earths can enter this too. Calcium and magnesium can also cause issues um, that we talked about earlier. The easily ionized element effect can be um, caused by having high concentrations of elements like calcium and magnesium in samples also. Okay, so first is <clears throat> what are your sample types? <clears throat> so we break that down, I mean, aqueous, organic, and high dissolved solids. So if your samples are aqueous, well, pretty much any one of the views can can handle that um, axial radius or or dual view. So there's not there's not a way to differentiate between between those. Um, if your samples are organic, well, we really I personally prefer to run organic samples using the radial view. Um, Usually, for most organic samples, wear metals and oil, and we'll see some examples of that in a bit. Um, people don't require the detection limits that you can get with axial or dual view systems. Um, and we also find that by going from an axial or a radial system to an axial or dual view system, especially with the organics, um, we don't see the, the great increase or anywhere near as much of an increase in detection limit capability. So you don't, it's on. It, to, from my point of view, it's probably best to keep that um, with with the radial view. Um, again, for wear metals, especially something like wear metals, um, the detection limits that people require simply don't need the axial view. Now, we do have people who want to do get really low um, operated with low detection limit capability on things like um, methanol or naphtha, um, and those those seem to work a little bit better. Um, on an axial or dual view system, um, they don't. You don't have as, uh, there's not as much carbon from like kerosene or xylene or like that. So it does seem that you know for organics like that, it's a it's a better it can be a better choice to go to axial or dual view. But for typical stuff that's being analyzed in kerosene and xylene things like that, I always really prefer that people stick with radial views. Um, it runs that really well, and the detection of the capability of the radial seem to be able to give people the, the results that they need. So next is we have high levels of dissolved solids. Um, typically, um, I like to keep those again in the in the radial view. Radial view can is just easier to deal with with 
high levels of dissolved solids, um, particularly um, for someone who wants to do really high concentrations um, to determine impurities and really high concentrations like brines or starting materials for something. I think the, the radial view um, is generally is generally good enough. It's possible you could do do view do views sort of not uh, it's I got to call it an orange because it's not my first choice for high levels of dissolved solids. Um, it's really very difficult to try and do straight brines on an axial or or dual view system. Um, you can get away with having some levels of dissolved solids. It really depends on the actual sol of dissolved solid. You could probably run higher level of dissolved solids if you're trying to run brine than if you're trying to run magnesium sulfate. Um, again, this is something that you know when you're you're looking at these systems, you'd have to have sort of more in-depth conversations about it, particularly with the applications people of whatever vendor um, you're you're working with. Um, you can't really just rule out the high dissolved solids um, on a dual view, but it de it definitely is more of a chore to be able to get accurate results with high dissolved solids on, on axial or dual view systems, mostly because now your matrix matching <clears throat> requirements get much much tighter. Um, you can sort of get away on a radial system, but on axial, um, not not matrix matching can give you some, some pretty inaccurate results. Next is the concentration range in your sample. Where do you where do you see your analysis? I mean, where, mo where, where are the concentrations of the elements that you're looking at? What are the detection limits you, you, you need, to, need to, to get? So if you're typically operating in, in the PPB level, those are your sample concentrations in PPB, or you need detection limits in the, in the low PPB, then, you, then you, you need to lean towards the axial and the dual view. They will give you the best detection limits. Right? Again, I mean, taking into account the previous answers, um, with the sample type um, for organic, aqueous, or high dissolved solids. If you're running PPM in, in the level of PPM, then you'd like to stick with the radial system. The radial will give you, you know, can give you PPB detection limits, um, not as low as the axial and dual view, but generally enough. Right? You have a pretty wide range. You go from PPB up to PPM, different types of samples. Again, that le that points towards the axial. Or, or the dual view system. PPM to percent levels, um, we, that's a good example to, for a radial system. And the, the really good example for that, I know I used it, um, said um, oil additives by dual view, but a really good application for additives in oil and wear metals in oil, um, things like that. Uh, axial uh, radial is really ideal for that. Um, because of the ability to choose all these different sensitivity wavelengths and be able to choose multiple wavelengths, you can calibrate the instrument from you know, very, very low up to 1,000 ppm or about three, four, to 5,000 ppm to get additive elements in. So it's a very good um, wear metals or a, a, additives in oil is a very good application. Then if you have looking at very, very low samples, very, very, and very, very high. Then, really, the dual view is probably the is 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 the way to go there. Again, it allows you to get concentrations from low PPB levels up to very high hundreds of ppm, and being able to switch to be able to take advantage of the dynamic range of the axial and the advantage of the dynamic range of the radial on the high end, the dynamic range of the axial um, or dual view system, or axial view on the low end. And then finally, the, the last question is the alkali elements. And basically, we ask this to determine whether or not you should have to differentiate between the axial view and the, radi and the, the dual view system. So if you, never, if you never run axial, or sorry, if you never run alkali elements, then you can get away with using an axial ICP. You don't have to worry about the easily ionized element effects. Um, but if you do, if the answer is yes, I have to run some of these elements, and typically people more commonly it's either lithium, sodium, or potassium, then the answer is yes, then it's either you want to stay with the radial system to avoid the easily ionized element effect, or go to the dual view system and use the radial view and the dual view system. 
Um, when we look at all the systems that we supply, again, we have all three available, axial, radial, dual view. It's almost an even split between dual view and radial systems. Um, axial systems are, we don't supply a lot of those, very, very small number relative to the other two. Um, again, just adding the additional capability of the radial view um, makes a lot of sense to people. So even though they may not ever plan on running the axial, um, the alkali element, they'll go ahead and get a dual view system um, just as a matter of comfort. The systems are designed actually that they can be modified in the field. So if you have, if you get an axial only system and then it turns out you need a dual view, um, that can be easily retrofitted in the field. And the systems can actually be modified. So if you get a radial system and you decide, well, we sh really do, do need, or my analysis requirements change, I do need to go to a dual view or axial system, that can also be retrofitted in the field also. But typically, if you're going to analyze alkali elements, then we recommend that you either go with a radial view system or, or the dual view system. Um, that way, you'll prevent having to do all the extra sample prep type stuff and incur in different expenses with uh, high purity materials to do the ionization suppressing or ionization bubbles. Okay. All right, just then we just take a look at some examples of some applications. Um, take a look at those questions and, and see where it falls out. So the first are wear metals in oil, very common application done by by ICP. So what type of sample? Well those are organic samples. And the concentration ranges, uh, people do wear metals, wear metals in oil, typically interested in PPM levels of, of oils, um, depending on the particular element the tip, and the, actually the particular portion of the equipment that the oil comes from. Engine oils are different from transmission, different from um, final drive oils, where the concentrations for some elements can be hundreds and hundreds of PPM. And alkali elements, do we analyze alkali elements for wear metals in oil? Typically, yes, they are looking for elements like sodium in the oil, um, which can be indicative of like a coolant leak. Um, so sodium and, and potassium are actually elements that people would analyze by, by ICP for wear metals in oil. So we typically re recommend that people who are going to be doing wear metals in oil or additives in oil or any of those oil applications, that they go with a radial, uh, radial system. The detection limits are not particularly low, especially when you compare to environmental um, type samples. So if we look at sort of typical results from a um, oil analysis, you see some of the the elements that are relative that are, need low detection limits typically are elements like um, lead and tin. Typically, those elements are present in wear metals. They like to see them at less at a ppm or less in the undiluted oil. And typically, the oils are diluted by roughly a factor of five or so. So you're you're looking at you know 0 0.1, 0 0.2 ppm in the in the fine in the solution presented to the presented to the instrument. Um, elements like calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and zinc. Those are relatively high concentrations. Um, those are part of the additive package, and that's generally something that people will look at when they do the wear metal. That'll let them know how much light time is left in the in the, in the particular oil. We look at the wear metal. People look at the wear metals for predictive maintenance purposes. So this is a good application for a radial system. Yeah, some elements that are relatively low, but not we're not looking at PPB levels. We're looking at 100 PPB, 200 PPB um, in in the sample, and then we'll have some elements that are present at very very high concentration, like the additive elements. So this typically wear metal system, we always um, recommend that people go with um, go with the radial system. Um, next is soils, and this is for someone who's analyzing soils by EPA method 6010C or B. So these are aqueous aqueous type samples. Uh, the concentration ranges in the Soil can be anywhere from PPB, things at really low concentration, again, arsenic, selenium, lead, thallium, can be at PPB levels in the, particularly in the prepared sample. But some elements that people may be interested in, things like calcium, magnesium, aluminum, iron, can be percent levels. And we are, we are definitely looking at alkali elements. 
in those soils. So here, this is an application where we recommend that people use a dual view system. You're going to have some elements that are going to be really low. You're going to have some elements that are going to be tremendously high. So if we look at results from, this is a NIST uh, soil from the San Joaquin Valley. And if we look at the final concentration, remember this sample is prepared generally by leaching one gram of, the, of that sample and diluting it up to 100 mils. So looking at a hundredfold dilution factor, but we can see elements like arsenic and cadmium present at relatively low concentrations in the oil, I'm sorry, in the soil. Things like antimony are fairly detectable. And then down below with the elements here that are highlighted in black, those are all pre present at percent levels. So figure whatever the concentration of a 1 to 100 dilution is, then we wind up putting all of those elements, and you can see the alkali metals there, the sodium and the potassium, but even very high concentrations of calcium and magnesium can cause problems with elements like potassium and sodium also. Again, they can change that um, the, ion, the equilibria inside the plasma. So we look with one analysis, we can go from the really low concentration arsenic, selenium kind of elements up to the percent levels for some of the elements like calcium, magnesium, and aluminum. Again, with one, so you do a 30-second integration by on axial instrument switch, and generally the integration times on a radial system are actually quite short, so maybe five seconds, maybe 10 seconds top. You're generally not worrying about um, detection limit capability on the radial as you're looking at such high concentration elements. And then next, um, wastewater. So these are people who are analyzing 200.7. Um, so sample type, it's an aqueous sample type. Uh, concentration ranges generally from PPB to PPM levels. And we generally are interested in analyzing the alkali elements. So typically people go to axial and dual view or dual view systems to, to be able to do this. They want to get the low concentration capability for the arsenic seleniums elements and um, thallium and lead also. And then the rest of the hot, some of the high concentration elements <clears throat> can be done um, on the radial view. Though, if you look at the requirements for method 200.7, um, radial ITP can easily meet all of the, all of the um, required um, method detection limits or instrument detection limits that you have in method 200.7, but a lot of labs have pushed the wastewater so that they can analyze the arsenic uh, selenium at the same time and by to get those um, detection limits down to the you know, contract required or desired of you know, PP, 10 ppb or or so, then you got to go away from the from the radial system. If you're not in, if you're not measuring those elements in wastewater, then a typical um, traditional radial system can give you um, all the results that you need. It easily easily meets the um, the performance criteria for, for method 200.7. So this one, whether you go axial or whether you go dual view or radial, really depends on what some of the individual elements that you're trying to, um, that your, your permit you're trying to determine for. Um, so you see some you know, contract labs will have uh, wastewater systems and they'll be radial and um, they can also, in some wastewater treatment plants, I've seen them go to, um, where as opposed, uh, rather than use graphite furnace, they can try and get some of those um, more difficult elements done on the on the axial view of the system. Okay. And so we've got dual view and just an idea. So here's a sort of a um, elements in uh, NIST. You can see some of the, again very high concentrations for some of these elements: uh, 5,000 ppm, six, almost 700 ppm, 3,000 ppm. For some elements, those are sodium. Those are, those you would do on the radial view, and the the low all the other lower concentration elements, those you would go ahead and and run those on on the axial view. Again, all the sample all the elements run with one uh, one analysis, as opposed to Having, having to run everything twice. So it sort of de um, keeps the 
analysis uh, analysis costs down by reducing the amount of gas and, and stuff. Okay, that's the last application there. Um, oh, actually, I did uh, concentration. So this is another uh, where so I talked about before. I actually, brought up the slide. So in a case where the concentration ranges are not going to be as as low, so you're not interested in X in arsenic and selenium, those are not elements that you're running with the particular unit, um, then you can go ahead and use a radial system for, for wastewater analysis. Again, as I said before, it easily meets the method 200.7 criteria. So then in, in conclusion, uh, let's skip that right now. Just oh, so what we found over time and then working with people when we've been manufacturing um, axial radial and dual view ICPs um, since the mid 1990s. So what we find is one view doesn't fit all applications um, and to be able to determine which system is best you really you got to look at the advantages and disadvantages of each configuration that nothing is free. Um, by going to ax by moving from radial to axial, getting those better detection limits, you do bring some additional um, things that you have to consider. Um, one of them is also level of, op of operator expertise. It's harder to get good results off axial and dual view systems compared to radial systems. Um, matrix matching is more you're going to have to bring in internal standards and you know, uh, modifications like that. So it's something that you just you need to take into account. If you need a dual view or you need an axial system, then then you then you've got to have it. Um, but again, what, why you're going through the sales process is good to answer. You know, look at these questions. Um, work with the who whatever vendor you happen to be working with to try and come up with what the what the best compromise is is going to wind up being. So to determine what the with your applications, we've always asked people to consider these three things. What are your sample types? What are the concentration ranges? Or what are the detection limits you need to achieve? And what elements do you want to determine? Again, we want to figure out if the axial is sufficient or if, if you're going to do the alkali metals and alkaline earths, if you need to add the radial view to that system, which in our experience has pretty much been the case. Um, again, very few axial systems. And I think you can look at the overall market too and the number of axial only systems has sort of decreased over the past uh, couple of years. Most manufacturers are supplying um, or at least giving the people the opportunity to get a dual view system out there. Um, again, because of the great capability and the great flexibility that it has, um, it, can, you know, it finds a home in, in, in a lot of different laboratories out there. And that brings us to the end um, of, the, of the seminar or the webinar. And I think now if um, people have submitted questions, we can go ahead and, and try answering um, some of the questions.